Imagine that you are a commerce student at UBC and for your third year summer internship, you land the internship of your dreams working in investment banking at an elite boutique in Los Angeles. And then at the end, you complete the internship, you impress your staffer and your team and they want to have you back, but you turn them down. Who would do that? What's the story behind that? Well, this is Matthew's story and he's about to share it with you all. Hey everyone, welcome to part two of Friday with Friends with Matthew. In part one, we detailed his background coming from Singapore his academic and recruitment experiences so far as an upper year UBC student. Spoiler alert, he worked at EY, BCI, and just came back from an IB internship at MOLIS. And now part two, we're getting down to the juicy parts. So what was it like actually working at MOLIS? Why did he decide not to come back? And what is he deciding to do instead? First question of part two for Matthew. How was working in MOLIS as a Canadian non-target student? Were you working with mainly Ivy League students? Did you ever feel that you had to prove yourself because your school name was less known? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it was, I, that was definitely the expectation going in. It'd be a bunch of like Ivy League students, you know, a little aloof and like, you know, UBC, like, what is that, right? So me and my friend had this little joke, like, that we were like, think that we're going to pretend that you know, we didn't know what an investment bank was. And we were like, you know, where are the credit cards at Molis and all that stuff? But I think I think the training in, in New York was sort of like um, the real, like where I got to see like, oh, and Ivy League students, stuff like that. And not, not to like, you know, insult them or criticize them or anything. But I definitely did notice a large difference in their technical knowledge versus let's say me or someone else from a non-target. And I think that just really comes from the fact that, you know, because we were some, from, you know, a certain school, like we thought we had to do that. And honestly, we did, right? Because we needed to prove ourselves and make up for, I think, the initial impression that coming from, you know, school like UBC creates. Um, everyone was incredibly nice. Um, like everyone was super pleasant. And, you know, I, I got, I made, you know, really good relationships with the people that I work with. Um, you know, and I just remember there's just this, this dude from like Dartmouth and training who didn't know what like EBITDA was. <laughs> and like, so that was sort of like, oh, okay, like that's kind of how it is. Um, but after training and then going into like MOLIS itself, actually, wait, no, sorry, back to training. And so I remember there was this like formatting competition that we had, this like, you know, Excel formatting competition. And our instructor, you know, had like told us all the instructions, like, okay, you guys got to do this and you got to get a hundred percent. We'll start the timer. And then, you know, when you're done, you raise your hand. And so, you know, all of us, you know, like go-getters were like, oh, hell yeah. Right. Um, and then hit the timer and then I'm like going like, and I'd spent May just like practicing, like modeling like, the whole time. I'd spent like a couple hours a day, just going through models, getting really fast thinking that like when I was at MOLIS, this would all you know come to fruition and I'd be able to show like my skill. Do the formatting challenge and then like, you know, I get 100%, I raise my hand and I'm like one of the first three out of a group of like a hundred people. It's like, oh, okay. And then my other friend also from UBC raised his hand like a couple seconds later, you know, we're like top five out of like a bunch of people. So not to say that like they were bad or anything. It's just that like, I think that, yeah, coming from a non-target, whether that's you know, real or not in terms of like, oh, you're less smart or less capable. I think there is a degree of like, you just needed to to grind a lot more, practice a lot more and try a lot harder to get good at these skills um, so that you could prove yourself in the interview. Now, going to the actual internship itself, everyone, you know, super smart, super sharp, right? Um, like worked at BCI, worked at EY, and I didn't have peers who were as smart and sharp as these people. And so like, I think I very quickly realized like, okay, you know, this is sort of like, you know, the big leagues, I guess. Um, but, you know, like during the internship itself, I still did, like the people in the LA office weren't all Ivy League students. It was like Duke, there was like um, one other Canadian girl from Queens. Um, 
you know, one guy from U Chicago, and then like most, I think other people were like Berkeley and UCLA. So it was a fairly, I think, diverse group of people, um, you know, and like there was another Singaporean guy there too. So that was kind of cool. I was like, oh shit, you know, like, like everything's coming from full, full circle. Um, now working there was interesting. Um, you know, as I, I think going into it, I had already pinned my sights on entrepreneurship and maybe we can get into this later, but I think for me, I was just waiting for like, okay, I'm going to try banking out. There might be something here, but if there isn't, then I'm going to do entrepreneurship. I'm going to do private equity or something else because I already have the BCI offer. Um, and yeah, like I think within two weeks, I was like, yeah, this, this just ain't it. Um, and honestly, it was just because like, I felt like I got dumber over the summer, like having practiced so much and learned like so much, like, and then actually doing the job itself. And I think this is normal, like in any sort of thing that you really need to prepare hard for. And then, you know, you like, you know, when you study really hard for an exam and then you do it and you have this like feeling of emptiness after it, you're like, oh, like that's all it was. And you'll still get, you know, really well for the exam, but it just doesn't feel the same as, you know, what, what the grind or the studying period felt like, right? You had that sort of anticipation, that fire and, you know, doing banking was like, yeah, like, I mean, everyone says this, but like, literally you're just a monkey and you're just like, following people you know it's like monkey see monkey do and you know when you get an instruction you just like execute and there wasn't that much thinking beyond like getting used to like file conventions or like how a process works and stuff like that and I think um you know I, I I'm just not really a person that like in all my internships I've just never been I just never go to the socials because I, I I'm just always like yeah I want to do my own thing like I think there's more productive things I can be doing and I think that rubbed my staffer the wrong way. Um, and so by the fourth week, I hadn't gone to any of the socials and they had arranged one like every week for us. And so like he calls me into his office and I'm like, okay, because it was sort of like our midterm review. And he's like, hey, Matthew, like I, I noticed you're just not as engaged as other people. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's true. He's like, you haven't gone to any of the socials, have you? I'm like, yeah, that's true. He's like, are you looking at, at other options? And I was like, yeah, I'm not like set on banking. And he was like, yeah, no, I've heard you've been coffee chatting people at Aries. And I'm like, no, that's not true. And it was weird because yeah, I had sent emails to them in February, but I had never done anything while I was in LA. And so clearly he had asked Aries, which was across the street, like, oh, you know, is this guy doing anything? Because he thought I was like taking coffee chats like during work and stuff. It wasn't, so he was like, so still skeptical. He's like, oh, okay, so what other options are you considering? And I'm like, entrepreneurship. He was like, oh, do you mean something more entrepreneurial, like, like growth equity? I was like, no, I mean entrepreneurship. And then he just like stared at me for a couple seconds. It's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, well, you know what? You should still like at least pretend that you want to be here. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Do you have any comments about like my work product or anything? He's like, no, it's been fine. I was like, okay, thank you. And then I, I just left. So after that, like, you know, I think this being like slightly arrogant stuff, like a fire had, had been lit within me. I'm like, I'm going to show this guy like what's up. Right. And so I spent the next four weeks just absolutely grinding my ass off. Like I come in two hours early, leave late and just like get everything done. And so by the eighth week, I've been working on this deal with, um, I've been, like liaising directly with an associate because the analyst was very busy on other things. Um, and so like we had just been handling like going back and forth and like a team's chat had like four people and it was just me and the associate like talking all the time. And so by that eighth week, I get a call from the analyst and she's like, you know, thank you so much for your help. Like you've been doing great. I really appreciate all you've been doing. And like, you know, there's typically like one analyst that really stands out and I think that's you. And so like, I'd love to have you back. And, you know, I just talked to your staffer um, and so I think we should discuss your future at the firm. So that was at night. Um, and I was like, I know what's going on here. Right. And so clearly she had talked to my staffer. He had told her that like, I'm not like looking forward to coming back. And she was like, but he should. And so we had, the, we had a chat the next day and, you know, we went, we had like a, you know, we walked around the mall and we talked for like 30 minutes and for about 20 minutes, like she just went on about Mollis, how good it was um and like you know like the future and like yeah we have you know our analyst to associate program all that stuff and then at the end of it she was like so you know what do you want to do and I was like entrepreneurship and she was like oh okay and then you know she asked me a couple questions about what I wanted to do 
told her I wanted to start a career consultancy. But that was sort of like, you know, at least to me, like that proved, okay, like, you know, I can do this if I, if I really want to, um, but it's just not the right, the right fit for me. And I think like, I don't say this to, you know, like be like, oh, I'm the best or anything. Um, but I'm just the type of person that like, like, I just want to work and like learn and do my own thing. And so I think in banking where like, you know, it's like work hard, play hard. And the play hard is almost expected along with the working hard. I just knew that like, I, I couldn't do that. Right. And I, you know, I don't necessarily like going out for parties and doing all that stuff. And so the social just wouldn't interest me. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to be intentional about the stuff that I would want to learn. And I'd always pinned entrepreneurship as something I'd do at like 28, 29, 30. But when I really like analyze that, um, I think this was coming into to, to the internship. There were two reasons why I had put it so far down the line. One, I wanted to develop some skills, right, over the next however many years um, that I could hopefully then leverage in, you know, whatever entrepreneurial endeavor I would take on. And then also a financial safety net. I think for the second reason, that's a fear-based reason, right? I'm, I'm scared that I won't be successful and hence I need money to support myself should everything fail. But no good decisions were ever made based on fear. And the other one, like skills, like, like that, that's just like stupid to me because I'm like, once I realized like, dude, like the way to get better at something is by doing it, not by like doing something else and hoping there's some sort, of, sort of like transferability. Um, and so going through that thought process, you know, reading some entrepreneurship books, listening to some podcasts, I think by the end of the internship, it cemented to me that like, yeah, I spent the last three years just like working for this. And I have no regrets about leaving it because I've learned so much during that time. But I think this is the point for me to like move on. Yeah, I think one thing that is a harsh realization when you get into these idealized and prestigious jobs as a student is that at the end of the day, it is a job and these are people, they're just trying to get their job done. And so Matthew, I had a question about that transition though, because you worked so hard to get the, to this point and you had such a realization, was it difficult for you? Did you have an identity crisis to be dramatic with it? Or was it just seamless transition realizing that, hey, I am here in IB, but entrepreneurship is the obvious next step? I think the the crisis probably happened before the internship because I'd spent January to April just really preparing for mega fund recruiting. Um, and I think like it was in May, I was training for a triathlon where I, I just realized like, okay, I don't particularly like, I don't, I don't understand why I'm studying so hard for this. Like, it just feels like I have nothing else to do. And so I'm going to do that. Right. Because this is where my future is supposed to be. Right. Getting better at technical, getting better at modeling and PowerPoint, all that stuff. Um, and so I think the crisis happened there. Um, and then that's when I sort of started like looking at entrepreneurship, exploring it, thinking about, okay, who am I? What are my strengths? What am I bad at? And, you know, at the sort of cross section of the two, what career would be the best fit for me? And then I think you have going into Molis, right? Definitely, definitely. Like it was a huge sort of like, oh, this is a job. Like I have to do this every day. Like, you know, it's not like studying for this like sick job anymore, right? This is your job. And like everyone else here has the same job as you, right? And so like, it, it definitely sort of, I think kind of going back to maybe like in the first video where like, you know, you pride yourself on going super far and doing these things. And like, then you're there and everyone else is like, has done the same work as you. And is just as smart as you, just as skillful as you. And it's kind of like, oh, I don't feel like so special anymore, right? And then there are people who are like so far ahead of you, right? Like MDs, VPs, and they're like, they just, you know, they're so much better. And I think that was definitely like a, you know, like hit to the ego. Cause like this whole time I thought I was like, you know, this special kid, right? Um, but, you know, again, like I think putting myself and, I think that came because after I got Mola to after I did BCI, like, you know, I sort of like prided myself on those things. And that became, you know, a large portion of my ego, which is bad because like a job shouldn't be the basis of your self-worth at the end of the day. When I think it's so easy to fall into that trap, especially when you spend so much time on it. And so I think that 
that was sort of like hit me and I was like, oh, okay. And so that was sort of like what made me, I think, think about entrepreneurship because if, if, if I'm going to do this thing and like my job is going to be, I guess, like my life or what I spend the most amount of time on, um, I want to be doing the things that I want to be doing. And because I'm a person that doesn't really have that work life separation, which, you know, like I completely admit and like, I don't think that's a problem. That's just me. Um, like I needed to be doing something that I thought would make a difference that I thought I really wanted to do and that I didn't do based on like some external perception of me. Right. And I think for so long I had been driven by that external perception that, yeah, like, like I said, before coming into it, you know, I was kind of like, oh, like I've been, you know, like I've been basing my ego on this for so long, like something needs to change. Um, and so that's why I gave like banking like a little shot because, okay, maybe it is going to be really interesting to me and maybe it is going to be something that I really enjoy, but it just wasn't. And so, you know, I guess sort of hinting at what's, what's to come, like for the past four weeks, starting this consultancy, like, yeah, I work a lot, but like I'm having the time of my life and I love helping my clients. I love meeting new people. I love creating posts. And, you know, for the longest time, I don't remember being as happy as I am today. Now, I want to double click on that. Matthew, could you talk about the golden handcuffs and if you experienced it during your internship at Molis? For those of you that don't know, the golden handcuffs is kind of exactly what it sounds like. They're handcuffs, but they're golden because this role may come with prestige and money. It feeds the ego. And so oftentimes there are people that are in these idealized prestigious roles like investment banking and consulting. And maybe you know them, maybe they're your friends and they just wake up every day super drained. It's like they hate their job. Maybe they even hate part of their life because of it, but they stay for years and years and you know, you might wonder why. Well, the truth is they have golden handcuffs. So Matthew, was that anything that you experienced? I don't think there was, there was that point because I think um, the, the drive or what the drive to get into banking was founded on was like proving to myself that I could do something that I didn't think I could actually do. Um, and so I was certainly tied to the chase. And I think at the end of it all, like I was sort of tied to, and I think this is a good thing, right? Like looking back and seeing the development in myself. Um, I think the money was never a huge thing for me. It was more like definitely the prestige associated with a job and certainly money is a component of that. But I didn't feel like I, I like I had to really break free um, of it. I didn't feel like there was this like in between where I was like, am I going to do this? Am I not? Am I going to do this? Am I not? I've always been a pretty headstrong person, um, which is a good and a bad thing. Um, and I don't really listen. Like I'm not the best at listening to other people because I always sort of like want to do it myself. And it's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing. Um, so I think the change for me was just like, you usually, I, and I've noticed this like throughout all the things I've ever taken up in my life. Um, I'll usually like have a thought about doing it, you know, at some point. And then a year later, I'll still have that thought. Um, and then that confirms to me that like, yeah, I should start. Um, and I think maybe what, what puts it into perspective is, so the January before I started the US recruitment, um, so coming out of winter break, I remember this, this was like January 3rd, still, you know, COVID lockdown, everything, classes were online. Um, and I remember watching this video from Alex Ramosi and who, if you don't know, is like, you know, like a super famous entrepreneur. He is like a huge YouTube channel. Um, but he, he like had this video where he talked about his life story, how he had to break free from consulting. Um, and then, you know, sort of where he is today. And at that point I was like, oh shit, like, entrepreneurship seems sick, right? Like, yeah, it's a grind, but like, I can do that. And so I like, because I was already invested in the recruit, like I kind of just put that thought off and never really revisited it until literally like at the beginning of this year. So like took me a year to, to actually look at that stuff. And then I read his book and then again, sort of like put it into like a sort of like a, a nook and then just started on mega fund recruiting. 
And then in May of this year, I sort of like revisited that. And so to me, that confirmed that like, this is something I should do. Like it's it's been in my head for a while. You know, I think working out exercise is one of those things that like when I was like 12 or 13, I kind of like looked at, didn't really start until like 14 or 15. Um, same thing for like committing to the whole finance recruitment and first year, it had kind of like been a thing for me. It was only like sort of two or three months into first year. I was like, okay, let's buckle down and do this. Um, and so just analyzing like sort of my track record, um, you know, sort of like confirmed to me and gave me the confidence to be like, yeah, I'm making the right decision. Okay, this is a way less sophisticated example, but for shopaholics like me, one of the best advices I've heard is that if you go into a store, let's say Aritzia, and you really like a piece, but it's super expensive, you should go home. But if you think about it, like let's say you think about it once for two days in a row, then maybe it's time that you go back in and you buy it. So it sounds kind of similar. You had the thought of entrepreneurship on your mind and you kind of came back to it. Okay, Matthew, now I have a career coaching question for you. My viewers are probably one of the most driven viewers in Canada. They are ambitious students and I know they're recruiting for top finance internships in Canada and in the United States. So my question for you as a career coach, and I'm your client, how would you best prepare me to succeed in both American and Canadian recruiting? Are they different? Are they the same? What are you going to help me out with? So I think if you're in Canada, then like one, Canadian is slightly easier um, and the U.S. would be harder. And so I think to put that into numbers, right, you would need to start a fair amount earlier to get into the U.S. and you would Canada because the U.S. and U.S. banks, when they look at Canadians, you're all grouped into like one sort of like bucket, right? And they're only going to take a chance on the ones who they know are solid, right? And the way that they know you're solid is if you have a track record of experiences that show you that you've been committed to this path for a very long time, or at least something that shows that you're you know, better than a lot of other people. And so I guess from my perspective, it was just I had more experiences, right? And so that's why it was sort of easier for me to get a US interview because I'd started a lot earlier. With Canadian banks, it's, it's, it's I think you can get away with having, with not starting as early, but you'd really need to nail the networking process. I think, if there's any Canadian kid who's been doing this from first year and has, you know, internship in first year that's finance related, like front office, one in second year, maybe one like part time one in between, you're going to get a Canadian interview like pretty easily, right? Because you're just being compared against other Canadians and you're better than them, right? But in like from the perspective of the US, right, that is sort of like you're now you're just like among the top Canadians, but you still need to like show that you're better than them somehow. Right. And so whether that's consistent placing that case competitions, whether that's just a volume of experiences that's so much larger than everyone else, you need to show some way, you need to show some sort of differentiation if you want to go to the US. Um, now, if, if you were my client, what I tell you is like, if you were in second year and you didn't have any finance experience and you wanted to go to the US and you still want to graduate in four, your odds are basically like zero because well, recruiting would start in January for the US. And so between now and January, you need to get at least like two or three experiences, solid experiences. And yeah, you could probably get a search fund and a case competition, right? But you need at least one or two more. And so, yeah, maybe you work two part-time internships, do a case comp, right? Yeah, like you have a pretty good shot, but you still need to do a lot of the networking, still work those jobs. And so it's, it's a bit harder. But if you're a second year that wants to recruit for Canadian banks, right? One, that recruitment cycle takes place a little later. And then two, right? Just your standard, I guess, or who you're being evaluated against, that standard just isn't as high as you would in the US. Now, if you're a second year student, just generally, what I'd recommend is like, you try to get an unpaid or part-time internship as soon as possible. And like searchfunder.com is a great place to look at search funds. But like, what I recommend people to do is, and this only takes like four or five hours. And this is what most people get wrong. Like, Go online, look at a list of private equity firms in Canada, M&A advisors in Canada, hedge funds, whatever it is, but develop like a list of like 300 places, okay? Then like you get the email formats for each firm, okay? Then you just email every single firm, like, hey, I'm a you know, second year student at blah, blah, blah. I've done this and this, right? I'm 
you know, I'm great at this, this, and this. I'm just looking to get some experience to get into investment banking. I'd love to work for you for free. Really anything. You don't need to train me, right? Happy to hop on a call with you. Okay, let's say of the 300, you get like a, let's be conservative here, 5% conversion rate. So that's about like, what is that? Um, Like 15 firms, right? Okay, 15 firms, cool. You have a call, you have 15 calls, okay? You can probably get one of them that's willing to give you a part-time job. Now, it's a numbers game. So like, if you don't get any from that, you just increase it, right? But that's what most people get wrong. Like to get the internship itself, Right. Yeah. If you're going for like big four firms, big banks, all that stuff, like it's harder because like you don't have any experience and the chicken egg problem really applies in that scenario. But if you're being frank with the firm that you're looking at, you're being honest, say, yeah, I have no experience, but I'm willing to learn. and I'm willing to put in the hours. I'm willing to just help you any way I can. They're so much more likely to help you. And guess what? When you have an MA advisor on your resume, it looks way better than being like a pricing analyst at like Scotia Bank, because that's not even relevant to investment bank. And so, like, yeah, it's way easier to apply to these things like through the portals and stuff. And it's harder to like grab the emails and get the email formats, all that. But like at the end of the day, if your goal is again investment banking, those six hours are a very small cost that you need to pay for the total amount of time that you need to, to accrue. And if you don't get that internship, you're probably going to need to extend graduation by a year. So you're paying more money. You're in school longer, right? Whereas if you just spent one weekend getting that whole list of firms, getting all the emails and then sending all the emails out on like that Monday, like you will get an internship by the end of that week, pretty much confirmed. And so that's sort of like the things that I show my clients is in the inputs that you need to get into investment banking. It's pretty simple, right? But it's the how and like the optimal way of doing it that most people get wrong. And they resort to, you know, what their career centers tell them, which is like, go to the networking events, talk to people, right? Try to like get a job at like a big four. But it's like, bro, networking events, like you're not going to make a difference. Like there's 50 kids talking to like three people. Like no one's going to remember you. So the thing I tell people to do at networking events, go to the event, just get their names and their emails, leave, send an email immediately, right? Be like, hey, I just met you at the event. I'd love to hop on a one-on-one. And then now you get 30 minutes with the person like, and they're just looking at you, right? And so it's just like these like little workarounds that you can have, but that give you so much more leverage on your time that help you get into investment banking much faster and way easier than if you just tried to like apply to all the portals in first year, never get any jobs. And then like, you know, sort of like be sad, like I'm doing all the right things. It's like, yeah, you are, but there are other things that you should be doing that require less time that will give you like a a better result. And so I think just optimizing those inputs, right, will get you that output. Um, And so that's sort of what I teach my clients, just the right inputs to have, how to execute them on a weekly basis. And then it's just a matter of time and consistency until you get that eventual output, which in this case would be an investment banking offer, private equity offer, whatever it may be. Okay, let's do a scenario question now. Matthew, I'm your client, and next week I have two interviews, one for investment banking for Goldman, New York, and one for investment banking at RBC Toronto. Do I prep for them the same? Do I prep for them different? What are you coaching me on? Only differences in terms of what you need to prepare is you, why RBC, why Goldman Sachs is going to be a slight difference there. If you haven't networked with anyone, it's going to be a little hard to come up with an answer because most people just resort to like whatever on their corporate website, which, yeah, but like, Everyone does that and that's like super easy and requires like zero effort. So your answer is not going to be high quality. I always recommend at least talking to one person. So you at least have substantiation for your why this firm answer. Even if that conversation went like really badly, you should be like, yeah, I talked to Joe and you know, I love, I love talking to you. She's so pleasant. And I think, you know, that speaks to the culture at the firm. Anyway, so that's, that's one thing. Um, you'd also need to prepare a deal for each of them. So Goldman Sachs can be a little easier, but right? Like it depends. So like if you're looking at the Seattle office, maybe they haven't done a deal the same that the New York office has done. And so there's a little sort of optimization that you need to do there and finding the actual deals that the particular office has done. Now with RBC, like you can be fairly certain that most of their deals are going to be at least sort of the Toronto team will at least have worked on them, maybe like teamed up with their New York office or something like that. But I think, you know, most guys, given how at least relative to Goldman Sachs, RBC is so much smaller. So the deals that they work, especially if it's a landmark deal, like everyone's going to know it. Whereas Goldman Sachs, that's not really the case. 
So th that's the two differences in terms of things specific to the firm. Um, you know, I think there's also things about if you have identified a certain type of person that goes to Goldman, a certain type of person that goes to RBC, when you do your tell me about yourself or you walk me through your resume, what you should do is work backwards from the character traits that, you know, the person at Goldman Sachs has, the person that RBC has, and then try and weave that into your answer when you're telling them about yourself. Um, and I would do that just for generally like any position really, right? Work back from the desired character traits and then the position's unique characteristics. And so that's why you fit in stuff like you can work well in a fast paced environment, right? You like working in a team, right? And you're telling me about yourself so that by the end of that two minute spiel, you're the exact candidate that they think they're looking for. Um, now, in terms of the behavior, I wouldn't say there's a large difference um, for those besides telling me about yourself, the why this firm, right? They're going to ask like pretty much like the general question. Now, the technical side. So what I've heard is that Goldman Sachs, because, and I think we talked about this last time, the bulge brackets tend to just fall back on like school and stuff. And as I mentioned, many of the Ivy League students just aren't up to par as much as like the non-target students are so if anything you can use your technicals at Goldman than you would at RBC um and so that's sort of like the only difference that I could um like suss out but your prep would be the same right because you don't want to like oh I'm going to pull back on my technical prep because I'm interviewing with Goldman like you're not going to do that so I would prefer them largely the same and the differences would just be in you know the walking through a deal that our team has done and the why this firm Yes, I can peep in here because I did interview for Goldman New York and RBC Toronto and Goldman was definitely a lot more behavioral. The only technical question, which is not very technical, that I was asked was how does an investment bank work? So I just answered about like investment banking, corporate banking, sales and trading working together to support clients. So it wasn't super technical. Um, but at the same time, don't not study technicals for Goldman, knowing that it may be more behavioral. I think the best advice is, as Matthew said, cover your ground end to end behavioral and technical. But don't be flustered if, for example, Goldman doesn't ask you a stock pitch, even though you prepared one. Don't feel bitter about it. Know going in that this is how it tends to be. It tends to be more behavioral. But should they throw in a technical question, you are ready to go. Same for a Canadian bank. Canadian banks tend to be more technical, but you should definitely have your behaviorals because they will ask them. And who knows, maybe you have an interviewer that likes to focus on those a lot more. So make sure your bases are covered. Okay, now here is the question y'all have all been waiting for. So Matthew, on your LinkedIn, it says you're graduating in April of 2024. We are dying to know, are you going back to Mullis? Are you going back to BCI? You talked about entrepreneurship. Is this like a part-time side hustle gig? What are you doing after this? I think your viewers could probably tell I'm not going back to Mullis. So we'll rule, we'll rule that out. Um, with BCI, I've yet to follow up with them. And I could if I'd like to. But honestly, right now, I'm more focused on entrepreneurship and like building FR consulting to as big as I can, you know, as big as it can be. Um, and then I guess the other plot twist is I'm not graduating in April 2024. I've extended my graduation to give me as much time to work on entrepreneurship as possible. Um, you know, over the next year, I really do hope to help as many students as I can to get investment banking. One of my clients is really close, just had his super day at a bank in Canada. So, you know, fingers crossed there. Um, but yeah, I think over the next year, that's the first goal, like help as many people to get into this making as possible. The second would be to learn as many skills as I can, whether that's sales, marketing, whether that's being a better coach, whether that's copywriting and marketing myself, whether that's just in like communication, right? I think I'm putting myself in a very new environment and like, I'm just going to learn a ton from it. So I'm really looking forward to the next year for that. And I think the last is like, definitely, yeah, on the financial side, hopefully I make enough money such that by the end of that year, by the end of two years, right, I can reinvest that into myself, learn as much as I can, and then hopefully, you know, either build FR to even bigger, start another business. But, you know, what I'm really good at right now is recruiting and teaching other people how to recruit. And so that's what I'm going to keep focusing on and hopefully use that as a vehicle to learn other skills um, through that process. Okay, Matthew, it's pitch time. Let's say I am an ambitious student. I go to a non-target or even target school. 
and I know that I want to do investment banking or sales and trading. And although I don't have any experience, I am confident that the passion and interest is there. I'm willing to put in the work. I think I can even go to New York, London, or Hong Kong. I truly believe in myself, but I just don't know where to start because right now I'm applying to jobs, I'm not hearing back, but I know I have potential. How should I go about using you as a resource and figuring out if FR Consulting is right for me? Yeah, I think, yeah, just being transparent, like you could certainly get in yourself. Like that's 100% the possibility. And like, by no means do you need to consult external help to get in. But what I've learned is, you know, you either pay with time or money. And I think in university, you have the highest amount of socioeconomic mobility that you'll ever have with the ability to do internships, network with people, you know, feign ignorance because you're still a student, right? So you get a lot of second chances. But by the end of those four or five years, right, like getting into investment banking, private equity, all that stuff, like it gets so much harder. And so if you are starting late or even if you're a first year, right, making sure you're doing all the right things from the very beginning to get into investment banking because this is sort of like your only shot to do that. And then, yeah, many people lateral, but if you ask them, and I've probably chatted many of them, like it is not easy doing that. And to some degree, there is a lot of luck that plays into that. And so I think, yeah, if, if because university is so short, you want to get everything right from the very start. And I learned everything through trial and error. I went through a lot of pain to, to learn what I know about recruiting and all the ins and outs and the secrets of it. And, you know, if, if, if high finance is your goal, right, there are certain things that you need to start doing very early on. And I always think that like having someone else, whether that's a mentor or someone that you're paying or a coach, right. But certainly like at least, you know, someone else who's been through the process, just telling you how to do it will be so helpful. Um, and I spent the first two years at university doing it all myself. And then I eventually sort of like got to be very good friends with an upperclassman and, you know, he told me like two or three things with what I was doing. And like my prospects changed immediately. And I started getting more interviews and all that stuff. And it's like, you can keep banging your head against the wall, doing all the right, the right things. Um, and yeah, you'll eventually get through it. But because you do have that time constraint, getting things right early is very important. And so if you know that's the goal, right, the ROI on any investment in a coach is so large because the amount you'd spend in comparison to what you earn right? I mean, that difference is so big. Um, and so yeah, that's my little pitch, my little plug. Um, but yeah, I, I love I love to, <laughs> to have any of your viewers on a call and then see what we can do. Okay, one thing that really stuck out to me as you were speaking was you either pay with time, or you pay with money. And I never thought about it that way. But as a university student, the four or five years of your undergrad is so so precious. So if you do have that money, you know, why not? Why not pay with that? Because time really is of the essence. So Matthew, let's say my viewers loved this series with you, Friday with Friends, and they're interested in learning more about FR Consulting. What are the next steps? I, I would hop on my LinkedIn page. Honestly, if you just search up, I think Matthew Farquhar, LinkedIn on Google should be the first result. You know, there's a link on my profile to book a call with me. Now, slots are pretty full. So if you are very interested in joining the program and talking more about it, or at least just like learning a couple of things on that call itself, send me a DM. Just like, let me know that you're you know more interested and, you know, I'll reshuffle some things in the calendar to, to move you up. Because yeah, all my slots are filled out for the rest of September. And I know time is of the essence. So, so just send me a DM. Congratulations. I didn't know that your calendar was all filled up for September. So I will have his LinkedIn as well in the description. So check it out and send him a message. And Matthew, of course, you know, I follow you on LinkedIn, but for my viewers, I want you to know that everything Matthew writes, I second. Like I've never seen a profile with content that I relate to as much as I do with Matthew's content. I think it's the Canadian perspective and just the common struggle of semi-target or non-target. Like you'll see me popping in the comments sometimes sharing my experiences. I know a lot of you follow me for early career content and that's not entirely what I'm focused on. I'm not the best at posting. I know I have different, you know, niches across this channel. So if you really want to hone in on 
early recruitment advice and something that I guess I like fully believe in, you should 100% follow Matthew, connect with him and use his resources. Anyway, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this series Friday with Friends, episode one, part one and two with Matthew and his story from IB at Molus to entrepreneurship. Episode two will be with my friend Zoe from Ivy. She pivoted from tech into consulting, which is a very unique pivot. Usually it's the other way around. So stay tuned for that next Friday and let me know who you want to see next. Bye everyone.